Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm continuing my uh, discussion in this video of um, human rights. I'm changing focus, however. In the last um, maybe two hours, I discussed an analysis into the relationship between intern internally displaced persons, refugees, and uh, human rights, and the corresponding concept of obligation and persecution, and fleshed that out in, um, in some detail, albeit sort of introductory detail. Shifting the focus of analysis in this section on uh, indigenous populations uh, and the rights of indigenous people and indigenous communities. There's a lot from the book that I'm using, um, Human Rights in the World Community, very, very, very good resource. There's a lot of information that I could have chose, you know, that, that I could choose from in this, many, many different topics that were discussed. Um, so in selecting the topics to present, I tried to pick the topics that probably had the least scholarship. So I didn't talk about um, feminist issues and human rights or civil rights and human rights because a lot of that has been covered. Indigenous populations, internally displaced persons, torture might be more of a contemporary uh, discourse, but definitely indigenous populations, IDPs, um, stuff that this discourse doesn't really take place um, in the sort of public sphere a lot. In my attempt in um, in selecting passages for analysis in this, what I think will be the first installment of Human Rights Lectures, is to shed more light. Um, we're nearing the end of the lecture series. Um, last I checked, we were eight hours plus in. Probably have another two hours of analysis to do just on indigenous populations, so maybe ten hours. I might conclude around the 12, 12, 13 hour mark, I would imagine, when this is all said and done which is a, a pretty sizable uh, lecture series. It's a, it's a lot of information, and that's the whole point, right? My, my role as a human being in the 21st century is to feed cyberspace with information, right? My, my whole process is to disseminate as much information uh, as accurately and as quickly as possible. And I think with respect to indigenous populations, there's just so little, it is horribly so little, that is said and done in recognition of indigenous populations because especially people in the West we really view the overwhelming majority of the globe as being industrialized in a sense and you can articulate industrialization in whatever sense you like there really are to you know very few not indigenous populations left indigenous people left comparatively speaking and the discussion is focused on looking at the human rights that indigenous populations have. The, the one thing that I have to say before I actually begin the discussion is the failure that we as human beings inherently have, our, our failure to recognize the rights of indigenous populations. There shouldn't even be um, indigenous population rights. Right? The fact that we are articulating indigenous populations makes us think, in a sense. It almost reinforces the conception of us versus them, industrialized, civilized, urbanized versus primitive, uncivilized, indigenous populations. For me personally, I have a bit of a philosophical, um, I have a, a bit of a philosophical aversion to the word sort of indigenous population. I know that members within the community embrace it, but for me the attempt to discuss the rights of indigenous population um, unfortunately reinforces the, the lack of civility, the lack of urbanization, the lack in the community. Um, and I, I would really like, you know, social scientists to, you know, potentially embrace a different word, right? I, I know it's a matter of semantics, but for me it's, it's important, right? Semantics, when you hear indigenous uh, immediately, you know, conceptions of uh, sort of savagery, barbarism, um, feebleism, that type of, those types of concepts are derived in your mind at sort of the John and Jane Doe, Doe level. And I think in order to do service to the population, potential discourse on sort of word selection is important. It's ancillary, it's not at the forefront of the discussion, just a side note. So with that, uh, we're going to begin uh, and continue the discourse into human rights, but we're going to focus now on the rights of uh, indigenous people and indigenous populations. So, let's begin. This is human rights. 
And this is section 6 of the analysis. And um, the title of the piece from uh, Human Rights in the World Community is Indigenous People's Right to Self-Determination and Territoriality. And in the first hour of the lecture series, many, many, many hours ago, I spoke about the concept of self-determination. So I'm not going to sort of revisit that concept of self-determination. I think the, the articulation that I gave of self-determination was good enough for an introductory understanding of the significance and the relationship between self-determination, freedom, liberty, equality, thus preconditions for human rights. Um, I, I, I fleshed that out, so if I went through that a little bit quick, just you know, go back to the initial videos, that will make sense. So I want to read uh, a quote that I thought was a very powerful quote from the text. When we talk about indigenous populations, what you're going to recognize is that the discourse on indigenous population is almost always going to pertain in some facet to a discourse that we had earlier with respect to the expansion and spread of global capitalism, right? So we're going to ask ourselves in this sort of introductory account initially, what is the relationship, right? What is the relationship between B slashes between indigenous communities and global capitalism? I remember we went into, uh, I went into uh, a rather, a rather sort of strategic, albeit fast, and sort of superficial, but nonetheless it's, it's you know, public discourse for free, I mean, it's, it's the best that I could do given the time constraints that I have, I have other projects that I need to get started and completed. Um, so given, given the fact that we recognize the global, of, global expansion of uh, capitalism, uh, is as pervasive an economic model as it is in its sort of um, monolithic structure, global capitalism that is, how is it that indigenous populations factor into a larger discourse of global capitalism? Because in the previous discussion um, that I had earlier in the couple hours ago in the lecture series on human rights, I didn't really talk at all about um, the relationship between global, global capitalism as expanding and indigenous populations. And the question is, well, what is that relationship? To begin, then, we'll see the author's interpretation of this relationship. And the relationship is one of parasitism. However, it isn't what you would expect, right? Or maybe you don't expect it, but it isn't sort of the parasitism of indigenous populations on global capitalism. It's um, interestingly enough, the other, word, the other way around. Conversely, it's global capitalism's parasitism on indigenous populations. Right? It's always the case, it's almost always the case, I can't say it's always the case, but it's almost always the case that once a population of people have been demonized, once a population, and I'm not saying that global capitalism is demonizing indigenous populations, but the term indigenous sort of evokes semantic concepts, right? corresponding sort of notions of what we mean when we say indigenous as opposed to, and I fleshed that out earlier, in discussing global capitalism and the alleged demonization of indigenous populations, what we recognize is that usually populations are demonized precisely because they are influential, precisely because they are needed, precisely because they have power. But in order to sort of uh, attack, circumvent any obstructions that they might pose to the expansion of uh, an antithetical source of power, in this case economic power, as manifest through global capitalism, the population is then demonized. So here's the quote, and I think it's a very powerful quote. quote. Global capitalism runs the world, generating excessive wealth for some, comfortable sufficiency for many, and unbearable poverty for all the rest, all the while rearranging natural and cultural landscapes at will, or um, at will, or aided by the American Imperium. Now, the, the American Imperium part, I don't know, personally, uh, I wouldn't, you know, global capitalism is an American phenomenon, so that's just my critique, and it's not 